Nazi Germany was a scarily powerful and highly influential force in the mid-1900s and is widely regarded, rightly so, as an evil empire with ideologies that should have never existed. At least, that is what is taught in our history classes in America, one of the victors of the Second World War. But Winston Churchill once said that history is written by the victors, and while that has certainly been true historically, history has been recorded on the losing side, the difference being that it isn't taught much in the countries that won. But what exactly happened from the other side's perspective? What was going on with companies that operated prior to, during, and after Nazi Germany? Why did American companies like Ford and General Motors assist Nazi Germany? Was it for their own profit or were they not given the choice? Today I aim to answer all those questions. Hello people of the internet, I'm Nico, a German car enthusiast born the day after Hitler's birthday. Yeah. I never heard the end of it when I was in school, and in this video I tell the story of why car companies got involved with the Nazi regime. First though, about 15 years of the history of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany in about 30 seconds. The Nazi party gained political control after Hitler was elected chancellor in the mid-1930s following the Great Depression by merging the offices and the powers of the chancellor and president. Using heavy military spending and pulling some economic levers, the Nazi party managed to stabilize the German economy and end mass unemployment, which highly boosted their popularity. Once they had secured the dictatorship, the real nasty work started, the Nazis took the ideology that Germans are the pure branch of the Aryan race to the extreme by, well, you know what they did. Now, our history classes have taught us all we need to know about what the Nazis did to any groups they didn't accept as Aryan, so I need not to go into that. But some companies in Germany, even American ones, played a role in the effectiveness of the operations of those camps, and some even took advantage of the labor those camps provided. But what exactly did all the involved companies do? Let's take a look at General Motors. General Motors is actually not the one that engaged with the Nazi regime. Well, not much anyway. It did, however, not object to its German subsidiary, Opel, working with the Nazis and providing most of the German forces military vehicles. Opel, while no longer a subsidiary of GM, was under their full control from 1929 through 2017. And it was no partial deal where General Motors only owned a fraction of the company, it was full control over Opel. And yet, General Motors, one of the big three American car manufacturers, did nothing to stop Opel from helping the German forces in World War II. There is, however, a reason for this. Opel was bought by GM in 1929 for over $30 million in 1929 money. Today, that's over $500 million. With that kind of money as financial backing, Opel became the largest auto manufacturer in Germany and all of Europe for that matter. In fact, Opel produced about 40% of all cars in Germany and accounted for a further 65% of all German exports. For context, here in the States, General Motors in 2020 had a mere 18% market share. Plainly, Opel was the powerhouse of motor vehicles in Germany, and General Motors knew that from the money they raked in, and Hitler noticed it too. Hitler kindly asked Opel to build a new factory just outside of Berlin for the assembly of trucks, which would later end up being used in the Blitzkrieg against Poland, France, and the Soviet Union. While the factory also sold to other customers, an increasingly large percentage of the trucks being built there were sold directly to the Nazi military, and to keep up with the German military's demand, Opel had to hire an extra 10,000 workers, technically making GM one of the largest employers in Germany. Because of the increased workforce and the increasing national influence of Hitler, Opel embraced certain philosophies of Nazi Germany, apparently even engaging in cultic worship of the Führer as a daily corporate ethic. And even though GM had sole ownership of Opel, it wasn't as simple as telling the workers to not engage in these practices, even though GM had the ability to. The Opel family, whom GM had bought the company from, had several members in the Nazi party, and the company had garnered a respected German persona, and to throw that away, despite the circumstances of the situation, would have been an unwise decision on a business level. This of course caused some tension within General Motors as well as between GM and America. So the president of GM, Alfred Sloan, and the chief executive for overseas operations, James Mooney, made efforts to obscure Opel's American ownership and to distance themselves from the ideologies practiced within Opel. And they did this by creating a directorate which comprised of prominent German personalities to be the face of Opel, which came with the benefit that GM was no longer in obvious association with Opel and their involvement. Never mind the fact that the decision to put up what GM officials called a false facade was made here in America by those officials at General Motors. 
Another decision made by GM was to bring the technology needed to produce leaded gasoline into Germany. Now, for the half of my viewers who are over the age of 50, you may remember when unleaded gasoline was introduced, and you may also know the health complications that came with leaded gasoline. But this is the moment when my home country finally got the additive the US was already using to improve how their engines functioned, while simultaneously infecting our bodies with the toxin that lead is. And for any younger viewers watching this who don't know about leaded gasoline or why we use unleaded gasoline today, sit tight and subscribe because I will have a video on that part of history soon and explaining why we're better off without leaded gasoline. Unfortunately, leaded gasoline is still used in some vehicles today, but I digress. The point I'm getting at here is that leaded gasoline was now a key player in Germany's blitzkrieg tactic because it now allowed all those Opel trucks the military had to perform better and more reliably, which actually gets into the story of how Standard Oil Company helped the Nazi regime by giving it the means to produce synthetic gasoline out of coal, but I won't get into that here. If you want to know more about that, read Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. I have a link to the book in the description below. But anyway, in large part thanks to General Motors, the Germans made France surrender in under a minute. Sorry France, I know you're sad about losing the World Cup, but those surrendering jokes will never go away. Jokes aside, I'm still not done with General Motors because once the war finally broke out, many factories, including Opel's in Berlin, were used to build all sorts of stuff and things for the war effort. One of the stuff and things made in Opel's factory was plane engines for the Ju-88 bomber, and two other stuff and things made were landmines and torpedo detonators. Now, a few things to be noted about business running in World War II. All American corporate interests in Germany were systemically placed under jurisdiction of a custodian who was appointed by the Reich. The job of the custodian was simply to look after the company, not to Aryanize it or dismember it, just to run it as profitably and efficiently as possible, and all the assets and profits would be placed in escrow until the war was over. Before you go and write a bunch of hateful emails to GM, it should be noted that during war, and this goes for America too, the government dictates what will be built in any factory that is assisting in the war effort. And since Germany was a dictatorship, Opel really had to build all those bomber plane engines and landmines and torpedo detonators and whatever else they likely had to make. The only control factor GM had in this situation was whether or not to keep Opel operational. Going back to potentially stirring some resentment towards GM, before Germany declared war with America, GM appointed Karl Luer as president of Opel. Now, Luer was a longtime member of the Opel Supervisory Board, and there was one other thing. Oh yeah, he was a loyal supporter of the Nazi party. Now, he ended up getting appointed as custodian by the Reich, so he would have ended up there anyway, but GM had put him in that position before America was even a part of the war. Here's where it gets really interesting. Obviously in America, a capitalist nation, companies are allowed to make a profit. Perfectly normal. And if there's something in the tax code that allows them to write off an asset, then yeah, that's allowed. Why do I bring this up? Well, in the years leading up to World War II, General Motors was listing the profits that Opel made for them as reserves. What did this do? Well, by technicality, it's not a profit as such, and so when GM supposedly cut ties with Opel when Germany declared war on America, GM took a full tax write-off for their purchase of Opel. This meant that, according to an internal document from Opel, GM got a tax write-off of about $285 billion in today's money. That's business for you. On the other side of the pond at Opel, things were going as expected. The company was actively supplying the military with whatever supplies were required, nothing really worth shaming the company for since they would have been forced to do so even if they didn't want to. What is more questionable is how they operated. Remember minutes ago at the beginning of this video when I mentioned the labor provided by concentration camps? Well, Opel was one of the companies that used forced labor, so anyone who was forced to work for Opel would either get worked to death in the factories, or if they were somehow no longer longer useful as workers, then you know what they did. After the war, General Motors and Opel joined together again as if nothing had really happened, and also received $33 million in war reparations since its German facilities had been destroyed by the Allies. So now it's pretty clear that General Motors, for the most part, acted willingly in their engagement with Nazi Germany. They kept Opel, obviously, since it was profitable and since they'd spent a significant amount of money purchasing Opel. So to sum up, General Motors did business with a dictatorship that went on to commit one of the most vile and cruel acts of violence ever performed formed on any group of people, they made millions and millions of dollars from both sides of the war, and so far as I can tell, didn't pay any consolation to the slave laborers of the Opel factory or any other GM-owned factories in Europe. 
Ultimately, history is often more than what is taught in school and is certainly more than what the victor writes, as Winston Churchill once said. GM has been hailed as the American institution and obviously, but also unfortunately, the other side of their past is swept under the historic rug. If you want to know some other immoral things that GM has done, like destroying public transportation in America, then watch my video titled, Why General Motors Monopolize Transportation. I go on to explain how their actions make poverty in America so difficult to escape. If you enjoyed this video, then subscribe for part two. I still need to talk about how Ford was involved with Nazi Germany, and that video will be out next week. If you want to know more about some other companies that were involved with Hitler, then I have some links to some very interesting books in the description below. Until next time, people of the internet, peace out.